All right, so we are now on to uh, rocks and minerals and plate tectonics, in other words, earth science. Okay, let me take a quick attendance here. Uh, let's see, James is not here, Andy's not here. Mike said he's going to be gone too, because he had to do something. Um, let's see, who else is not here? James, I got James already. Uh, Louis is Louis not here. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Smaller class tonight, huh? Okay. All right, so rocks and minerals, and then plate tectonics. Now, I will caveat this whole next couple of lessons by saying this is not my specialty. In other words, um, I'm kind of, uh, I'm not an expert on this stuff, so if I can't answer your questions, I will look them up and try to answer them next time. Um, but uh, we'll see how we go. Uh, by the way, our little uh, lime clock is still running here, still going. So I don't know if we should leave it for the, uh, for the next group tomorrow. <laughs> They'll come in and be like, what's going on with the math class? But I don't know. <laughs> All right. <coughs> so let's take a look. Earth science. Obviously, we're talking about the Earth. Okay? This is a picture of, <coughs> excuse me, of the tectonic plates that are uh, in the Earth's crust and mainly what's responsible for things like earthquakes, okay? And also responsible for the surface of the Earth actually shifting over time. And it's not a fast shift, okay? It's like centimeters per year, something like that. But millions and millions of years go by and the Earth actually shifts, okay? And we'll get into some of the details about that uh, as we go along, okay? I, uh, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, don't look if you happen to have your book open. The makeup of the Earth, okay, it's made up of a relatively, well, it's made up of over 100 different elements. We already know that, right? But most of the elements, there's only eight of them that make up the majority of the, uh, of the Earth, okay? So I know you guys read about these, but let's think about some of the big ones. What are some of the big things that are in the Earth? Uh, is oxygen one of the big ones? Okay. Carbon. Carbon. Is carbon one of the big ones? Uh, I'm not sure. We'll see. Silicon. Okay. Silicon might be a big one. How about the biggest? Hydrogen in the Earth's crust, maybe. We'll see. Or in the Earth itself. What else? What else do we have? Iron. Iron. Yeah, iron's a big one. In fact, iron's the big one, right? Okay. So we've got some. So we said, uh, I heard carbon. Uh, nickel. One of the big ones. Calcium. All right. Well, let's see. Let's see how you guys. Did somebody say nitrogen? Did I hear that? No. Okay. Now, now, what's the proportion of nitrogen in the atmosphere? Seventy-nine percent. Seventy-eight percent, something like that. Seventy-eight. In the atmosphere, not in the Earth itself. So, in the Earth itself, take a look here. Okay, iron. A third of the Earth is made of iron, which is interesting. I mean, we are one giant rock of iron, right? Oxygen, a huge amount. Okay, thirty percent almost oxygen. Silicon, 16%. Nobody said magnesium. It's almost 14% of the, of the Earth is magnesium. Okay, we did get some nickel in there, 2%. Calcium, about 2%, good. Aluminum, 1.5. Sodium, 0.2. What, didn't, what did one of you guys say that isn't up, up here on this list? Carbon, hydrogen. Those do not make up a significant portion of the Earth itself. Okay, carbon and hydrogen make up a significant portion of you. Right? Living things make, are, are prim primarily made of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and all that. But not like the inorganic part of the Earth is not, most, is, is not there. That's all in this other like 2% part. Now, by the way, this isn't talking about the atmosphere itself, which does have carbon dioxide and oxygen and nitrogen and all that, but the Earth itself. Okay? So eight elements, 98% of the Earth. Okay? Now, it is not evenly distributed. All those elements are not evenly distributed as you might think. Okay? If you go down far enough, it's not, not going to get much oxygen, for instance. Okay? When we talk about the geosphere, okay, all right, we're actually talking about like the Earth itself, right? Like the Earth part, not the atmosphere and all that. Okay? Um, here's what happened. When the Earth formed, Okay, when the Earth formed, it was mainly like it was. It was basically a whole bunch of pieces from whatever like star exploded or whatever that formed into the Earth, and the Earth just started gathering more and more and more pieces. Okay, and 
it was hot enough so that it was molten. Okay, the entire Earth was just molten whatever. Okay, and in that early molten state, melted state, okay, it formed into a sphere because of the gravitational forces involved. Okay, and the heaviest elements, namely the irons and the nickels and those really heavy elements, sank to the middle because the, the gravity basically they it was they were more dense. And so buoyant forces and all, the more dense ones, sink towards the middle. Okay? And it's literally like the middle of a three-dimensional <clears throat> sphere. Okay? So the core of the Earth, in other words, the middle of the Earth, has mainly iron in it. So most of the iron sunk, well, the iron, a lot of the iron sunk to the, the middle. And the lighter elements, the oxygens and the silicons and all that, stayed near the top. Okay? So we've got a couple different pieces here. We've got the crust which, much like a crust of, on pi, is actually a very, very, very thin layer. Okay? The crust is, well, relatively thin. Okay? It's, not, it's, it's thick enough that we can't just drill through it. Let's put it that way. But it's, it's thin, relatively speaking. Okay? Remember, we're talking about, um, what is it, about uh, 8,000 kilometers to the center of the Earth. Okay? From here, right? Like 3,000 miles or something to the center of the Earth. So that's a pretty good distance there. All right, but the, the crust of the Earth, very thin comparatively. Inside the crust, we have the mantle, which is this underlying section. Okay? In, from the, in the mantle, which is pretty thick, actually, you get into the core, which is made up of two parts, the outer core and then the inner core. Okay? Which, one of, the, which of all these ones is the, is the liquid? Any idea? We'll get to it, but mantle is not liquid. Nope. The inner core is actually solid. The outer core is the, is, the, is the liquid part. And we'll talk, actually, after we get to the next chapter about how we actually know that that's the case. Okay? All right. So the crust here, which is where we all live, like right at the top of the crust there, is mainly silicon and oxygen. Okay? Sand, if you will. Okay? Most of the stuff on the surface of the Earth is sand and is silicon and oxygen-based material. It turns out. Okay, you dig down a little bit, you can get some other the other elements. And of course, there's lots and lots of other elements that are spread out throughout the Earth, but um, mainly those are how they spread out. It was all about density and all about the fact that the Earth was cooled from a molten state, and the more dense things sank to the middle. All right, so let's talk first about the crust of the Earth. Okay, that thin little layer at the top. Again, most of it's oxygen. Almost 50% of the crust is oxygen. Almost 30% silicon. Okay, so what uh, 47 plus 28 is what? 47 plus, twi- 47 plus 28 is 75. You're right. So about 75% of the Earth, of the Earth's crust, is oxygen and silicon. That's a lot, right? <clears throat> the rest, all this other stuff. You've got some aluminum and iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium. By the way, still no carbon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not quite, not, doesn't, doesn't quite ri- rise to the level, no nitrogen. Okay? 75% right there, all right. And that's the crust. Now, let's get into talking about what these things called minerals are. Now, if you look in the back of your Wheaties, you'll see it says, you know, fortified with minerals and vitamins and blah, 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 and you can read all the different minerals and vitamins. Well, the definition of a mineral to Kellogg's or General Mills or whatever is slightly different than our definition. Okay? Our definition is that a mineral is a naturally formed, in other words, it can't be something you create in a lab. It's got to be inorganic. Most of them are inorganic. There's, uh, I think there are some organic minerals if you really want to get into it, but inorganic meaning not life based. <clears throat> okay? And then crystalline, meaning they are, they are formed into a crystallized structure. In other words, a very regular pattern of the atoms. Okay? And it doesn't necessarily have to look like crystal, whatever you think that looks like, but we call this crystal, uh, crystallized composition. So uh, question is, glass a mineral? No. Can glass be created naturally? Yes. Sure, you can get glass created naturally. In fact, when a lightning bolt hits the sand, sometimes it actually forms the sand into, into glass. Glass itself, though, not a mineral because it's actually not a crystallized substance. It's uh, what we call amorphic, I think it is, which actually flows a little bit. Okay? Not fast enough to actually notice, but it's not crystallized. 
Okay. Oh, it is right here. Amorphous. Okay. Uh, synthetic diamonds. Well, diamonds that you dig out of the ground are definitely minerals, but the synthetic ones, no. If you make them yourself in a lab, no. Okay. What's that? They're the ones that are made in the lab, not naturally formed, so not a mineral. Okay. Things that are minerals: table salt. Okay. Halite, we call it. Uh, quartz is a mineral. Calcite, talc. There's lots of different types of things that are minerals. Okay. And we'll get into some more details about those. Okay. But remember, naturally formed, inorganic, crystalline. All right. Now, much like some of that organic chemistry that we did that you all loved so much last time, minerals, we have to get into some of the classifications of minerals. Okay? And we're also going to do the same exact thing for rocks, talk about classifying these things. Why do we do that? Well, we do it for a number of reasons. Number one, to kind of give you a feel for how, they're, how we classify them. But also, especially in terms of rocks, we have to talk about how we have to talk about why the rocks are classified such that we can figure out where they came or to talk about where they came from and then how they form into other um, types of uh, or, or the rocks form into other rocks and how they actually came to be to learn a little bit more about the earth itself. Okay? So we can classify minerals by uh, the chemical composition. If it's a, if it's a uh, Certain composition of chemicals, that is a type of mineral. Okay? We also can look at the crystal structure. So you can have the same type of mineral or same type of chemical. I'll give you an example in a minute. And a different type of structure of the element, however it's put together. And they're two different minerals. Okay? Physical properties are the expression of the chemical composition. In other words, they're not. It's not, such, it's not so much the physical properties or what defines the chemical. It's the chemical itself defines the physical properties which we use to, defi- to sh- determine what the, ca- the uh, minerals are. Okay? So we've got things like the form, the hardness. Okay, we'll talk about what that means. This thing called cleavage, which you guys all laughed about. And then fracture, color, density, all these things together we can look at as far as trying to figure out how to define what a certain mineral is. Okay? All right, you guys writing down the things? I'll give you a sec to write this stuff down. Okay. Drawing them all out, yeah. Well, I know on the next slide we've got an example of, I think it might be the next or the next slide after that, crystalline structure. In the book they give this exact same example of a a, a mineral, two minerals that have the same chemical composition but are different minerals. Graphite, Graphite and diamond. Both made of what? Carbon. Both made of carbon and totally different in their makeup. Okay? Yeah. All right. So we'll get to that in a minute. The crystal form. Notice this nice regular pattern here. Okay? It looks like a, in this case, this is salt. And you've got a nice boxy pattern there. The, the molecules line up nice. There's, there's, oops, there's a, uh, like a sodium and then a chlorine next to it and a sodium and a chlorine and a sodium and a chlorine and all around in a nice, uh, in this case, cubic structure. Okay, and if you look at salt under a microscope, it actually is little tiny cubes. Pretty cool. Okay? They're not, they're not round like you might think. They're actually little tiny cubes. And they're very perfect cubes, actually. Okay, and that comes from the structure that uh, the crystal shape that they have been formed with. Okay? So this internal atomic arrangement. Okay? And the crystal, the way the crystal grows and the, the form that it's allowed to grow in also determines um, how you actually, like the form that you get. Right? So sometimes you can get uh, nice regular forms like this, but a lot of times you get kind of disrupted forms. Like it tries to grow that way, but then there's something else in the way, and so it has to kind of grow somewhere somewhat differently. So you don't get these nice um, natural well-formed minerals in nature very often. When you do, like you find a very natural well-formed diamond, it's worth a lot of money, right? Even though diamonds, believe it or not, there's lots more diamonds out there than you might be led to believe. Diamonds should never be as expensive. They should not be as expensive as they are. You disagree. Why? Ah, but there's, but there's lots and lots and lots of ore out there. 
let's put it this way. There's a company named De Beers. There's this company named De Beers, which has a corner on the diamond market. Basically, they own like 99% of the diamond mines in the world, and they just storehouse all these diamonds. They only let a few out at a time, and so they control the price. They control, so it's all supply and demand, yeah. So, and by the way, you can make artificial diamonds that are exactly like the ones you find, and you can't tell the difference even with a microscope or anything. Um, and those are much less expensive, so. Yeah. And they're just, they're exactly the same. Identical, yeah. What's that? They're not cubic zirconias. That's slightly different. Uh, it's called De Beers, D-E-B-E-E-R-S. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, own, they have a monopoly on it. Here we go. So these are the uh, polymorphs that we just mentioned a little bit earlier. Poly meaning many, and morph meaning like changeable. Polymorphs are the, these minerals that have the same elements in the same proportions, but they're just arranged differently. Like diamonds, which have this nice regular kind of um, built up structure, okay, versus uh, graphite, which is like sheets of uh, sheets of carbons that are different, formed differently. Okay? They're both pure carbon though, but they're formed differently. And if you notice, like diamonds, the really, really hard substance, right? They can actually, diamonds can scratch any other substance versus graphite, which um, is very soft and actually can, can kind of come off in these little sheets, okay? It's because of the way they're, they're done. But again, same, same atoms, different structure, okay? All right. So I mentioned this a second ago. The hardness of a mineral is not like how easy it is to break, like you might think. The hardness is just, will it scratch or not? And here's how you test two minerals against each other. You try to scratch one with the other, and whichever one wins, whichever one doesn't get scratched is the harder one. I mean, that's really the way it works, okay? Normally, you'll do it on some other like test surface. Um, but you can, you can do that. So diamond will scratch any other mineral, and uh, none, no other minerals will scratch diamond, and you've got to go down the list. So diamond is a hardness of 10 <clears throat> versus some other things in here. Uh, let's see, what else might you have heard of in here? Calcite, the hardness of three. Talc, hardness of one. Your, your fingernail is a hardness of about two and a half, which is this uh, mineral called gypsum, which is a little less hard than that. I thought the sapphire crystals are hard. Sapphires are hard? I'm not sure. Maybe they are, yeah. They probably are pretty hard, yeah. The Swiss watches, they have they are scratch resistant, and they make the crystal. Oh, yeah? Swiss watches are scratch resistant, they make the crystal out of sapphire? There you go. Okay, I didn't know that. All right. <clears throat> but it's not, people don't like diamonds necessarily because they're hard. Well, depends. If you're using them in a drill and you want to drill through something, they're great. You can get diamond tip drills or diamond cutting saws. And they just have diamonds on them. They, buy, they have industrial diamonds, which aren't the pretty ones, but they're just as hard, so they can cut very easily. Good stuff. Okay. All right, now we get into this cleavage property and this other property called fracture, okay? Cleavage is this, uh, when you break a mineral, it might break along a certain, like at a certain angle along a certain plane in that substance, okay? These planes of weakness, again, it all has to go back to how the crystal itself is, does, is built, okay? And if it doesn't have any of these easy planes where it can cleave off, we call that fracturing. Okay, so some things fracture, some things cleave. If you take a look at, uh, let's see, if you look at this thing called muscovite, okay, it's like this, um, it's this hard rock, and if you like smash on it, it will, it will turn into these little sheets that look like little pieces of glass. It'll turn into sheets like that. That's because along one direction, it's, it comes apart very easily. And so that's what these sheets come from. Okay, if you do the same thing with uh, calcite, this, it kind of looks a little like salt, but it's clear and it's cubic. If you smash up calcite, it will smash into littler cubes or little rhombuses, not necessarily at right angles, but it will just smash into littler ones that are like that because it's got three-dimensional cleavage. So it will be able to um, break into parts that, are, uh, that also look very cubical in nature, so kind of cool. Okay? And sometimes you fracture, which just means they smash, and you don't get any specific type of direction. Yeah, question? Okay. All right. Okay.
course, minerals also have a color and, of course, density. And we know all about density. Um, color is not a very good way to determine what kind of mineral something is by, by just looking at it. Okay? Because they can have impurities in them. And they can be um, different colors just based on the impurities. So you can't necessarily tell what, what color it is. Um, for instance, I think ruby and sapphire are the same mineral, actually. But they just have different impurities in there. Okay? However, you can test with this thing called a uh, streak test, where if you take a, uh, like a piece of slate or something and you take the, chemical, the, the mineral and you streak it across that, the color of the streak is always the same. So these two, even though one's red and one's blue, if they're the same, if they're the same mineral, they will actually have the same color streak. Why that's the case, I'm not exactly sure. Okay? But it, um, it's one way to tell uh, apart. Now, not all minerals will do a streak that you can tell apart from all the other ones. So it's not like you can do it and go, oh, that's definitely this. Some streaks are colorless or whatever. Um, but, uh, but for the ones that make a defined streak, no matter what the color of the mineral itself will, the, the streak itself will be the same. Okay? And of course, we know that the density is just the ratio of the mass to the volume, just like it was in physics a couple, couple weeks ago. Okay? Uh, and you can use that to determine what kind of mineral something is as well. Okay? Lots of different ways to tell what kinds of these minerals are. Okay? All right, here's a check question for you. The physical properties of mineral are predominantly related to what? Temperature, pressure, and space available for growth. The chemical composition of the internal arrangement of atoms. The crystal form, hardness, cleavage, and fracture, and density. Primarily or all of the above? Got a couple of all of the above? Yeah, it does say predominantly related to. So let's see. Does the physical property, does the physical property, can, can the temperature, pressure, and space available change the physical property? To some extent it can, right? It can, it can make it so that it's not, it's not as regular as you might think. Okay, I suppose that's a physical property. How about the chemical composition, the internal arrangement of the atoms? Is that, a, is that base, is that determine the physical properties? Yeah, I guess so. How about the crystal form, the hardness, cleavage, and fracture, and density? Well, we talked all about those. Are they related to those? Like physical properties related to the crystal form, hardness, cleavage, fracture, and density? It's actually more the result of them, I would say. I would say that the, the physical properties are, are manifest in these things, but they're not really related to them. I mean, these are the physical properties, but I'd say more, it's probably the chemical composition. Okay, this one to some extent, but probably this one more. Let's see what it says here. Ah, there we go. All right, so chemical composition is really the, the main, that's really how, what determines the physical properties, how tightly the atoms are, what form they're in, when they make the crystal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that determines what color it is and what uh, the hardness is and density and all that. Okay, so not the best question in the world, but there you go. Okay. All right, some more classification for you. Okay, two classification types. Minerals. Silicate materials, and silicates basically have silicon in them, by the way, and non-silicate materials. Well, part of the reason we care about silicates is because there's lots of silicon around. Okay, so in fact, 90% of the Earth's crust is silicate materials, oxygen and silicon combinations mainly. Okay? Silicon material is made up of oxygen, silicon, and some other elements. There's definitely titanium in there, al aluminum, magnesium, iron, etc. Magnesium, okay? But silicate and non silicate. And most of them are going to be silicates, most of the minerals we talk about. Okay? All right, there are two types of silicates there are ferromagnesian silicates. Okay, if it's ferromagnesian, do you think I can use a magnet on it? Yes. Probably, right? It's ferromagnetic, as it turns out. Contains iron or magnesium. Tend to have high density, like iron's got a high density. Magnesium has a pretty high density. So, um, and they're dark. Iron is a dark uh, element, and so it ends up making these dark minerals. Um, and generally, they have the ability to be, uh, you can you know, test, test them with a magnet. Okay? You can also have non-ferromagnesian silicates, right? No iron or magnesium. 
and they're generally lighter, den less dense. Okay? All silicates, though, kind of look like this. They've got an oxygen in there, and they've got silicon around the sides. Okay? All right. Or is that back? I might have done that backwards. It might be silicon there and oxygen around the sides. Uh, that's a good question. I forget which one it is. I'm not exactly sure. Well, regardless, they look like, the form looks like this, whether it's the silicon in the middle or the oxygen in the middle. But I forget which one it is. Okay. All right. All right, check question. What's that? The four, the four ones are the oxygen. OK, so the one in the middle is the silicon, and then oxygen's around the side. That's right, they keep making the oxygen's the red ones, don't they? Yeah. All right. That throws me off sometimes. They'll change it up on the other I know, they probably will change it. OK, so the silicates, uh, OK, here's the question. Silicates the most common and abundant because silicon and oxygen are what? Hardest, most abundant, found in quartz, formed in tetrahedral. Yeah. Number two, the most abundant. Absolutely. They're not facts. Nope. They are not the hardest elements on Earth's surface. No. <laughs> All right. OK. How do we get minerals? We form them from crystallization. OK? There's a couple different ways to do this. When we get into rocks in a little bit, we'll talk all about magma and how rocks like actually form into these into these crystal structures, right? You can also get water solutions. Anyone ever been to like caves or caving and you see the, the little things hanging from the top called stalag tights for top and then you got the ones at the bottom, stalag mites, right? Those are formed from water solutions when the uh, the crystal actually either drips out of the water and forms those things or in some cases you can get water solutions if the water evaporates. Well, what's left over is this, uh, uh, this mineral that's the precipitate from the evaporation. Okay? Water solutions uh, associated with later stages of crystallization um, from magma are important ores. So a lot of the things when you dig up these important ores, you can get, uh, you'll end up getting uh, some crystal, uh, some minerals from those, which is what happens when the magma itself cools down. Magma being the molten rock. Okay? And as we said, as water solutions uh, become saturated, well, either they become, either the thing evaporates or they become saturated, and you can end up with this precipitate, which is just the minerals. Okay? And how do you end, why do you end up with the ore deposits in between the cracks? Well, lots of reasons. If it's liquid when it forms, it can seep into the cracks and then form. If, especially if it's like molten, then it can seep in and then just cool down. Or you can have it so that it, like if the liquid kind of passes through, it can deposit some of that crystal on there. Get that too. Okay. All right, still writing. You don't have to write all this down. It is online. Oh, well, writing helps. What's that? I know I'm flying. There's a ton of slides tonight, mainly because this, these are kind of some dense chapters. Okay. So minerals are the minerals that crystallize from being molten, being melted. The reason they're crystallizing is because of their uh, well, they're crystallizing because the the molten rock actually starts to cool down. And it's the ones that have the, what, highest boiling point or lowest boiling point? Well, I should say melting point uh, or freezing point. The ones that have the highest or lowest are the ones that are going to crystallize first. Well, if it's the, well, let's think about this. Let's say you have substance A, which has a melting point of 1,000. In other words, it's solid all the way up to 1,000. Because the melting, what's the difference between the melting point and the freezing point? What's the difference? Okay, let's talk about water for a minute. What temperature does water freeze at? Zero. Zero degrees Celsius. What, what, what temperature does water melt at? Yeah. In other words, when it's when it's solid, what temperature does it melt at? 
No. How about zero? The melting point and the freezing point are the same point. You guys just got to think about it right, right? It, just because it's just because it's ice, it's still water, right? So water in ice form melts at zero degrees. It also freezes at zero degrees. That's the whole like point, right? So again, let's go to back to two different types of substances. Substance A freezes at a thousand degrees Celsius. Substance B freezes at ten degrees Celsius. If you're cooling something down, which one's going to freeze first? The one that's the higher temperature or the lower temperature? The higher temperature. No, because the lower temperature is still melted. OK, different example. Iron. OK, you take a block of iron, melt it like, I don't know, 3,000 degrees Celsius. Really hot temperature. Ice melts at 0 degrees. You boil them both. Somehow you keep the ice from or you don't boil them, you melt them both. Sometimes you, somehow you keep the water from turning into a gas. You pressurize it or something, right? You're cooling them down. They're both, boil, they're both melted. So they're both a liquid. You're cooling them down. Which one freezes first? The iron. The iron freezes first. And by freeze, I mean solidifies. I don't mean freezes like gets cold, cold. I mean like turns into a solid. It's the one with a higher temperature. Okay. So, First, minerals to crystallize are the ones with the highest melting point, also called the highest freezing point. <laughs> right? Melting and freezing, same point. Right? Okay? All right. Well, for whatever substance you're talking about, not necessarily zero degrees. That's just water, basically. Fresh water, in fact. Okay? The last one's the ones with the lower melting points. And by the way, the amount of silica is what determines it. Silica actually uh, has a very low melting point. Okay, so if you've got more silicon in your uh, in your mineral, it's going to melt last because it's got a very or it's going to freeze last because it's got a very low melting point. It's making sense. It's a little. This is a little tricky. I'll give you that, but it's a little tricky. But that's the way it goes. Okay. Okay. So what is this here down? This this little thing that you can barely see on the screen. Let me zoom in there a little bit. Okay. If you have a low silicon content, okay, your melting temperature will be high. Therefore, you will melt last. Wait, does that make sense? Melting temperature is high. Mm, I don't think, think that might be backwards. The order of crystallization. Oh, sorry. Order of melting is last. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're heating something up, order of melting is last. Order of crystallization is first when you're cooling something down. I think they should have flipped this and called it order of of solidifying. Is what they should have called it. But anyway, if you have a high silicon content, you're going to melt at a low temperature. You're going to melt first. You're going to freeze last. You're going to solidify last, and therefore you're going to crystallize last. Makes sense. Well, this is not. This is this, this is a little tricky, but you know. there's a there's a final. All right. So okay. So let's keep going on the formation of minerals. So water solutions. We already talked about that. You can just precipitate out the chemicals. Okay. Uh, some of these chemicals are called evaporites, which we'll talk a little bit about in a bit, a little bit more about in a bit, which means they form when something else has been evaporated out, when namely the water they're in has been evaporated out. What's left are these uh, crystals, these minerals that come from the fact that you've got no more water there. Okay? For chemical sediments, in other words, the, se the, the sediments that are coming from these solutions, Okay. It's not the melting point that determines which ones form. It's which ones are less or more soluble. So exactly the same. It's like analogous. If you're not very soluble, you're going to precipitate first. You're going to come out of solution first. You're not that soluble. Okay. If you're more soluble, well, you'll be in solution longer and longer and longer, even if there's less and less water there. Okay. All right. It's the first time I've seen you guys write all this stuff down. Not all of it. I can't catch up with you, so you're high speed. 
Well, this is, a, but as I said, all this is online, right? Yeah. Both the video and the slides are online. What's that? Yeah. Well, it's also, you also got your book, right? Yeah, of course. So you don't have to write all this down. OK. Now, haha, we finally get into the rock types. Now, this actually, I think, gets a little more interesting once you talk about how these rocks act, actually get formed. OK. There are three types of rocks you will need to know about. And types being like a very big term. OK. I will not ask you to determine marble from slate, for instance. I'm just not going to ask that kind of question. Right? I might ask, uh, what's the difference between sedimentary and metamorphic? But I'm not going to say, tell me what sandstone versus limestone are. I'm just not going to worry about those details. Right? You need to know three types of rocks. Igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Okay? And here's the overall difference. We're going to go into lots more detail in a few minutes here. Okay? Igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are formed when, thing, when a molten system of like rock or whatever else is melted and then cools down. Okay, that's an igneous rock. If you think of lava or magma, which we'll talk about, that's where you get the igneous rocks from. Okay? If you end up with any of these other types and they melt, well, whatever forms is going to be back to being igneous because it's melted. Okay, that's the whole point. Okay? Sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks come from pre existing rocks which get either weathered away or eroded. So, like an igneous rock that gets weathered away can end up being a sedimentary rock. Okay? By the way, examples of igneous basalt, granite. You'll see lots of granite around the, the surface of the earth. Okay? It just happens there's lots of granite around. You also see lots of sedimentary rocks. Okay, sandstone, limestone. When you, when you see the side of these, I'll show you some more pictures in a little bit. When you see the side of these, you'll go, oh, I see or some of these sedimentary rocks. You'll actually see the sediment layers in the rocks. You can actually see the different layers in there, which is caused by the sediment coming down onto it okay, and being squished down. And then finally, you get these metamorphic rocks, which are also formed from pre existing rocks. Remember, if it melts, it goes back to being an igneous rock. Okay, metamorphic rocks, which are formed by heating, not melting, but heating, pressure, some sort of chemical. Okay, that's how you end up with metamorphic rocks. And things like marble and slate are examples of metamorphic rocks. Okay? Yeah, question. Igneous is going to be the crystallization where it has all these different pieces into it. So those are going to be solidifying at different temperatures. Right. So it's like the black. Solidified first because it has the highest melting point. Exactly. Uh, orange has the lowest. Exactly. That's sort of, yeah. Like if all that stuff breaks away from the granite, the heavier stuff's going to sit and the lighter stuff's going to take it off the wind and then it's going to be consolidated by itself. To That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. You, you, can, you can get sedimentary rocks from igneous rocks by these this weathering sort of way. So yes, that's, a, that's definitely the way you think about it, the, the way you're gonna, we're going to start thinking about it. Again, we'll get into some more details here in a little bit. Okay? But that's the way, that's the, way the, the basic part of it. Okay, let's talk about igneous rocks. Okay? Igneous rocks come from this stuff called magma or lava. Magma is molten rock material that's underground. Once it reaches above ground, it's not magma anymore. It's lava. Okay, Same stuff, but it's called lava then instead of uh, magma. That's really the difference. And if you ever saw Austin Powers, he talks about liquid hot, liquid hot magma. Okay. Yeah. All right, molten rock, melted rock. Okay, I'm going to show you some a little video of that in a little bit. Okay, so how do we actually get magma? That's a question. Okay, as you go down through the Earth's crust, okay, you get about 30 degrees Celsius hotter every kilometer. Okay, which means it gets pretty darn hot pretty quickly as you go deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. 
the rocks in the lower crust and upper mantle, right? remember there's the cr tiny little crust, and at the, at the bottom of that and the upper mantle, they're getting pretty close to melting. Okay? And if you have additional heat from like other rocks descending into the mantle, or uh, from the rocks actually sinking down a little bit into the mantle, or you get heat, like temperature increases from like heat coming up through the mantle, may start to melt the rocks. Okay? It may start to melt the rocks. But heat is not the biggest part of this. Okay? Heat is not the biggest part. Heat actually is a minor player in all this. What's more important is pressure. Okay? As you get deeper into the court, the pressure goes way, way, way up. Why? Because there's lots of stuff above you, lots of rock above you, and gravity's pulling all of it down towards the center of the Earth. Okay? So as these rocks kind of sink to the bottom, or as they're closer to the center of the Earth, and we're not even talking about close to the center quite yet, but when they get like deeper, you get lots and lots and lots of pressure, and that pressure is what's going to cause these things to start melting. Okay? So for instance, remember we already talked about the fact that the inner core is a lot of pressure, okay? and so it's actually solid. It's too much pressure. solid. And a pressure cooker, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm kind of backwards on this. Sorry, I'm, I'm backwards on it. As you get lower pressure, you end up melting the rock. So in other words, the rock that's deeper, I should restart this, the rock that's deeper has more pressure, okay, and is less likely to be melted. As, they ri as the rocks kind of rise up to the surface, they are depressurized and start to melt. So it's not really the temperature increase so much as they can't be melted when they're deeper. So I had that exactly backwards. Um, and so you can think of it like when the rocks start to come up to the top. Yes, they get warm. Well, they actually get a little cooler because of the rising up, but they get less pressure. And the pressure part, the lessening of the pressure, is what's really uh, giving it the ability to melt. There's also, um, once this, these rocks have little cracks in them and things, and some water might get in there, the water will actually change the melting point of the rock as well, meaning it will lo melt at lower temperatures. Okay? It's like when you add salt to water, uh, you actually get a lower temperature melting. Okay? All right, let's take a look at a couple of these videos. I think I've got these ones on my computer. I hope I do, because this one still is broken over here. Don't know why. Uh, hit the lights, please, and I'll start this over. Okay. Let's see. All right. There we go.
down the mountain. Yeah, it's slideshows on. Uh, do that. And I want to do this. So that, so that, so that. Minerals, so that. Rocks. Magma. Igneous rocks. Next. Okay. Um, what I want to do is make it full screen. There we go. Wow, thank you. Okay, so igneous rocks, okay, and the generation of this magma that we just saw. Okay, we already talked about pressure and how important that is. Okay, the reduced pressure, because I said it wrong before, the reduced pressure is what allows um, the rock to actually start melting. This is already really, really, really hot. In fact, it's hot enough that in given regular pressures, it would just melt. Okay, But what happens is it, uh, it, it uh, doesn't do that. Okay, So now, let's go to a check question. Even though the temperature at depth is hotter than rock's melting point, the rocks at depth are solid. Why? Are they under enormous pressure? Does the increased pressure prevent their melting? Does the temperature would have to be even higher to counteract the pressure, or all the above? This one's all the above, right? Because it is true that they are under pressure. You need more pressure. The more pressure prevents them from melting. And you'd have to have an even higher temperature to make them melt when they're not, when they're under that kind of immense pressure. Okay. All right. So the melting of rock into magma, you do have it at a different temperature range. Because remember, different substances do melt at different temperatures. All right, igneous rocks. Whew. Okay, this is all about melting. If you're, if you're, it's again, it's the same sort of stuff we've talked about before. If you've got high silica content in that magma that we saw, you're going to melt first. Okay, and when it's cooling, you're going to melt. You're going to freeze last, basically. Okay. Um, and depending on what makes up the igneous of the magma is what kind of rock you get out of it. Okay? The, the magma that forms the rocks that are in Hawaii is different than the magma that might form the rocks in some other volcano. Okay? It just happens that that's the way it goes. Okay? There are three kinds of magma. Okay? We're going to talk more about these in the cha next chapter. There's this ball basaltic magma and dacetic magma and granatic. Any, any, any idea what kind of rock granatic magma will form? Granite, maybe? Okay. Okay. You classify igneous rocks by where they're actually formed. Okay. So if they're formed in magma that crystallizes underground, we actually call those plutonic rocks, just like Pluto. Right, plutonic rocks, and we actually call them those rocks plutons, believe it or not. Okay, rocks that are formed from lava at the surface, we call extrusive versus intrusive or plutonic, and we call them volcanic rocks. Okay, so if you get a volcanic rock, and it actually is a volcanic rock, it means that it came from lava at the surface. Okay, sorry, I'm seeing lots of writing again. 
Remember, online. Stuff's all online. Okay. All right. Aha! Volcanoes. Three types of volcanoes. Shield volcanoes. Cinder cone volcanoes. And composite volcanoes. Okay? We don't need to know more about them except the fact that shield volcanoes kind of look like this. Cinder cone has a little cone thing in there. Okay? And composite are kind of a little bit of both. All right, now I do have a couple of volcano videos that I will show you. Okay, and the volcano videos, there's, there's two. I think they're both about uh, Mount St. Helens. You guys know about Mount St. Helens? Anybody from the Washington State area or Oregon or anything like that? Yeah, you are. I um, which is Which is next to what? The composite, this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure where that is. That's Mount Fuji? That's Mount Fuji? Oh, okay. Well, um, so I'm going to show you a couple of videos on, on Mount St. Helens. Now, when I was a little kid, Mount St. Helens actually exploded and like volcanic eruption. And they did lots of videos on it. They have some good videos, footage of it. Um, and it's kind of amazing. Killed lots of people. Well, like 50 people, not lots in the grand scheme, I suppose, but killed like 50 people. Killed one scientist who was actually the one who first saw it. He's like, oh my gosh, it's going to blow. And then he got knocked, you know, got killed. Uh, but I'll show you uh, both of those. And if you could hit the lights again, we'll take a look. Say again. What's that? The ash did go around the globe, yeah. This one is from the USGS. The eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980, was one of the most dramatic geologic moments in American history. It was a Sunday morning, 8.32 a.m. Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, was the excited call on the radio from David A. Johnson to his colleagues. Within minutes, the colossal eruption had caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damage, and 57 lives were lost including Dave Johnston. For two months prior to that eruption, scientists with the U.S. Geological Survey and the University of Washington's Pacific Northwest Seismographic Network had been closely monitoring the volcano. All the deformation on the mountain was, was local to the mountain, and even more local than that was on the north side of the mountain only. In the nearly two month period before May 18, what was essentially happening at Mount St. Helens was that magma or molten material was moving up from some deep reservoir beneath the mountain up into the volcano itself. And it began to grow um, or form what we call a dome or a cryptodome inside the volcano. And that inflating body of magma or molten material actually broke the north side of the volcano and began to cause. Sorry. To expand out toward the north. We were measuring the rate of, of, uh, of northward movement of the, of the balls at about six feet a day, and uh, we knew that wasn't so good. On the morning of May 18, I was driving up Interstate 5, um, headed up to the north side of Mount St. Helens with some parts and some batteries for our time-lapse cameras. And as I glanced over at Mount St. Helens, um, it was a beautiful blue um, sky day, and the mountain was sitting out there, and suddenly I saw this mushroom cloud go up above the volcano and climb rapidly up into the stratosphere. When I was down in the, in the room where the seismographs were at 8.32 in the morning, and I, I heard a sound, and I just looked over my shoulder, probably just a split second after the, um, earthquake, the, the big earthquake had started, and saw that this was something very large, larger than we'd seen before, watched it for a few seconds just to confirm that. And then I ran upstairs to the next floor up to the radio uh, desk of the Forest Service and uh, called, uh, called Dave. And we couldn't get through. There was, there, was no, there was no answer. So I guess I had the realization right away that um, this was some kind of a tragedy. And uh, on the one hand, it was this huge, exciting, and interesting magmatic eruption. And on the other hand, it was, I was pretty certain that something terrible had happened to Dave. So it was a, it was a a strange day for me. And uh, we were off the ground probably at uh, 9.05 or something like that. I mean, it was really, really rapid. And I uh, got up to the, uh, to the point where we could really see the, the mountain well, I suppose between 9.20 and 9.25, something like that. 
there was this terrific, um, very vigorous uh, vertical eruption column uh, that was the uh, stem of the mushroom or the toadstool that then blossomed out at, at greater height. Uh, and uh, for most of the morning, we saw this tremendous uh, ash cloud uh, roiling out toward the, toward the northwest. And I can only assume that that was coming off of the big pyroclastic flows that were going off in that direction that later built the pumice plain. It was a very eventful morning, but uh, it was uh, sobering because I remember thinking up in the airplane that it, Dave just couldn't have survived this, um, especially when we got around to the west side and saw all this ash headed in his direction. On the morning of May 18, what actually happened? The landslide basically uncorked this pressurized body of magma and allowed it to um, explode or expand out towards the north very rapidly. This is what we call the lateral blast. Um, it was a horizontally directed explosion of incredible magnitude. It caused this expanding cloud of ash, rocks, and gases to move out across the countryside to the north at speeds of several hundred miles an hour. The directed blast was really the most destructive event that occurred on the morning of May 18. It completely destroyed an area of 230 square miles in the matter of um, somewhere between five and, and nine minutes. It essentially killed every living thing um, within an area of 230 square miles, and it destroyed hundreds of acres of virgin forest, and uh, it was an incredibly spectacular event. We put on news stations, uh, and we quickly started to uh, re-monitor the volcano again because we had no idea what was going to happen. Before the dust had literally settled in the summer of 1980, um, there were USGS scientists swarming all over the area out in the blast zone, studying the pyroclastic flows, studying the debris avalanche deposit, studying the directed blast deposit. Uh, we thought it likely that there would be more eruptions during the summer, and indeed that, that took place. And suddenly this immense black eruption cloud came pouring up out of the white um, layer that the cloud tops and I couldn't believe my eyes I mean I thought this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life we we learned a lot about how you interact with the civil defense with the public um, with the press and that was transferred by the press to the world and as a result I think volcanology took a quantum leap in science as well as applicability to, to society's needs. The subsequent eruptions were actually, most of them were forecast fairly accurately by the USGS team of scientists. So when it looked like another explosion was about to take place, our helicopter crews would pick us up and we'd move out to the outskirts of the, of the blast zone. We'd watch and photograph the next eruption. And as soon as the eruption stopped, we'd race out there and study the deposits while they were still hot while they were just after they'd settled onto the ground. So it turned out that the six years that Mount St. Helens was erupting in the early 1980s was an unprecedented opportunity for USGS scientists to study hot, fresh, young, and exciting deposits from explosive volcanism. We learned incredibly new and important bits of information about how volcanoes like Mount St. Helens work, what kinds of deposits are produced during these explosive eruptions, and how to anticipate and mitigate the consequences of explosive eruptions. Trust me, the second half I think is better when we talk about tectonic plates. It's more interesting if you ask me. Okay. All right, um, so we, that was igneous rocks, okay, magma and so forth. Sedimentary rocks are most of the rocks that you will actually see. Okay? Two thirds of the Earth's surface is made of sedimentary rocks. And we get sedimentary rocks from like four different things. Weathering, erosion, deposition, meaning you depositing various layers on top, and sedimentation, where you have sediments that are forming onto things. And you can see the layers here in this sandstone. See it's like dark and light? That comes from this, this layering effect due to uh, like the sedimentation and the deposition. Okay? Sedimentary rocks, okay, you can get them from weathering, which is two types of weathering. One is the regular old type of weathering you might think of in terms of physical. Um, the rock gets hit by, by water, it gets hit by 
um, wind, it gets hit by, it gets squashed by other rocks and that sort of thing, okay? Breaking and disintegrating into various pieces. You can also get chemical weathering, which actually chemically changes the rock, like oxidation maybe, or some other type of um, chemical process that's changing the rock. Remember, we are not talking about melting. Melting, you get igneous rocks, okay? All right. Mechanical weathering, there's a bunch of different types. There's this frost wedging. So when it gets cold and the water expands when, you free, when it freezes, it breaks apart rocks. This is not rocket science here. It's rock science, right? This is, um, this is not that hard. It's just, you know, you're freezing and thawing the rocks. It's going to change it. Okay? It's going to physically break it. It's going to crack it, change the rock. You also get thermal expansion of the actual rocks themselves. When things heat up, the rock expands. When they cool, they contract, etc. You can also get uh, plants and animals that are, you know, building their burrows in the rocks and, and scraping it away for various reasons. And plants, you know how sometimes you can plant a seed inside like a rock and it will actually like break the rock apart as it grows into a tree? That's sort of mechanical weathering, okay? You can get chemical weathering. This is where you get all this sediment, okay? This is where you break the rock down due to um, like water actually uh, chemically changing the rock and chemically breaking down the structures and reforming it into other types of minerals and other types of uh, components, okay? Chemical weathering, all right? I know I'm flying through these, but there's lots of slides and I do want to get back to the video. Erosion is a physical weathering uh, the way that it physically weathers. Erosion is when um, you're actually removing material from these rocks. Okay? Some sort of movement is involved. You're, gonna, you're like water washing over the rock, erodes it away. Okay? The Grand Canyon was formed from like eroding. Okay? You've got like millions of years of water flowing through this, this rock, erodes it away slowly and slowly, slowly and surely. Okay? Deposition is where you end up getting these particles that come to rest in some uh, area, okay? Well, the larger particles, of course, come to rest first. The smaller particles, like if you're in water, will wash farther down the river or whatever, okay? And you sort the particles that way. Top ones here, well-worn. You can see they're kind of roundish. There's not too many jagged edges and well sorted. They're the same size really. Okay? Some jagged edges, but they're well sorted here. Poorly sorted, lots of different sizes. They haven't washed down river very far. Okay? I guess technically you could figure out how far up river you are by the size of the particles. Right? The farther down the river are, the, short, the smaller the particles are going to be, generally. Okay? And of course you've also got sedimentation, which is really what, where these things get their names. So the particles are actually deposited onto a layer of rock, and then another layer gets deposited, and another layer gets deposited, and eventually you get all these layers, and there's pressure involved, and there's time, really, is what's mostly involved here. Okay? You've got a lot of time to produce these rocks. Rocks do not form overnight. I'm talking about a nice slow, slow process, like hundreds, thousands, millions of years. Okay? Um, there's this a term called lithification. Okay, lithification is when the rock actually hardens into its form, its final form. You can get that from compacting it, squishing it down, or cementing it. And cementing, we're not talking about like cement you make in a mixer, right? We're talking about like natural cement, like mud that actually uh, turns into this glue type substance that cements the rock together. Compaction, material above it squishes it down. That's all it is. Deeper and deeper layers, okay? You just get more and more compaction because you got heavier stuff on top. Pretty simple stuff, okay? Compaction actually releases pore water. In other words, let's say there's water inside a rock. Well, when you squish it down, some of that water comes out, and that water has dissolved minerals in it. Well, those minerals actually can turn, can be this cement type substance 
and will glue the sediment particles together. Okay, it doesn't, again, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a long period of time. Speaking of cement, anyone ever been to the uh, Hoover Dam? In, you've been there in Las Vegas, or outside Las Vegas, like 45 minutes outside Las Vegas? If you take the tour of the Hoover Dam, which was built in the 40s, I guess, or I think it was in the 30s or 40s, they talk, they talk about how this, they put so much cement in there that the cement to this day is still curing. Some of that cement is still wet. Like that's how much cement there is, right? All the stuff that makes it secure is, is fine, but some of the cement is still curing. Well, at least they said that like five years ago when I was there last or 10 years ago. A year ago when you were there, they said that, yeah. They love that story. It's not dry yet, yeah. yeah. And cement, by the way, cement isn't really a drying process so much as a curing process. And the same thing happens here. Cement, you can actually pour cement underwater and it will harden. Right? You mix it, and once it's mixed, it stops absorbing more water, and, it, and, and then if you pour it into water, it will, it will harden underwater because it's already like in its curing stage, so the chemical reactions are happening to harden. But the, water may, like the actual water may come out of it, but it's, not gonna, it's still going to harden underwater. So. You can't dilute the cement by putting more water in it, no. Once it's in that stage of curing, you're done. And, uh, so, yeah. like, trucks are driving around in the barrel, those, is that already cured? Or? Nope, that's the, the, with the trucks that are going around, they've got to they've keep it going so it doesn't actually cure, and it's the motion that's keeping it from, you know, finally getting in that state, I guess. I mean, I guess, I don't know if you kept doing it all day, eventually it would cure, I'm not sure, but, yeah. There's a good Mythbusters. There's, a, yeah, some good Mythbusters where they try to, like, explode, put dynamite inside a, a cement truck that's been hardened, had yeah, hardened cement in there. And, uh, and it stopped turning. And, yeah. What about it? What? Oh, yeah, we're talking about a whole cement truck, the one that's like round and turns. Yeah. Okay. All right, more classification. Sedimentary rock, like the first six times I read this, I read it wrong. What does that look, look like? Classic. classic, right? It's not. It's clastic. Well, that's what I thought it was classic. Clastic rocks. Clastic rocks come from when the sediment actually gets, um, it comes from when the sediment gets transported from one area to the other, and the bits and pieces end up getting kind of together. Okay? You've got clastic rocks. Chemical rocks are rocks that were once in solution like stalactites, stalagmites, limestone, that sort of thing, where water is washing it down and it's actually coming out of solution, turning into these rocks. Okay? All right. Okay? We can also classify them by particle size. Like I said, the book goes into so much classification on this. Shale. Mud-sized particles, tiny little layers. You've all seen shale where you, uh, if you cut it, it, it shears very th into very thin pieces. Okay, shale is actually uh, used in lots of different, used for flooring, shale is used for roofing, okay, it's very common, okay. You can also get sandstone, which has, even, which has sand sized particles, quartz, which is mainly sand, mainly silicon dioxide, uh, is the predominant material in, in sandstone. And you can also get conglomerates, which are large, even larger particles and rounded gravel particles that get kind of glued together with this cement stuff. Okay, I, don't, I wish I had some pictures of that. I don't have pictures of that one. Okay. Chemical sedimentary rocks. That looks like Chex Mix to me. <laughs> that's what that looks like. But what that is is that's coral that is, was once a, uh, that was once like living that has now been uh, kind of come together and been glued together in this rock. Okay, this is limestone in this case. Okay, you've got calcite, which is what the uh, coral actually forms its bodies out of. Calcite. Okay, and this is all when they talk about coral reefs, broken shells, chalk, that kind of stuff. That's what forms limestone. Okay, all right. Then we have these evaporites, which I mentioned earlier. Evaporites are 
evaporation actually triggers the precipitate. So in other words, you evaporate the, the liquids there. It's got this rock material in it. The liquid evaporates, and you're left with this rock that's now not in solution anymore. Okay. Rock salt and gypsum. Okay, rock salt is the stuff you put on your highways in cold climates to keep it from uh, to keep the ice off because it mm -hmm. melts in the northeast. Cold climates, not in the northwest. You don't do that. Use sand. Oh, you use sand. Yeah, sand works alright too. And there's gypsum. Okay. We we teeter right around 32 degrees. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to worry about it. All right. So another type of sedimentary rock, chemical sedimentary rock, is coal. Believe it or not, coal is considered a rock. Okay, it comes from organic material. And first you get plants, then you get this stuff called peat, which is when the plants die and they form this really thick um, kind of material on the top. Then you get uh, this stuff called lignite, which is when you're starting to get pressure and heat and compression down. Then you get this stuff called bit bituminous, right? More pressure, more pressure. And then finally you get a metamorphosis happening, which is when it's all kind of coming together and, and ending up in these various layers. And you get anthracite, which is um, the coal material, which burns very well because it's got all this organic material in it. Okay? And anthracite coal is the good stuff. If you're in, from coal country, you like the anthracite, from what I understand. Okay? All right. The most characteristic feature of sedimentary rock is what? Do they have fossils? Mm, I don't think they have fossils. The lithification and cementation of sediments? Yeah. yeah, some do. Some have sediments. How about the layered sequence of strata? The layered sequence is definitely a sedimentary rock characteristic. And you also have the fusing, fusing of unconsolidated sediments into solid rock. The most characteristic feature. Hmm. You think number two, the lithification and cementation of sediments. Nope. Oh, no. Strata. If you see, if you see sedimentary rocks, you'll generally see the, the layers in there, I guess. Not always, but I guess. Okay, finally, last type of rock. Metamorphic rocks. Metamorphic rocks. You get them from igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks or other metamorphic rocks. What's happening here is you are recrystallizing the rock. Okay, you get slate here, kind of like shale, but it's this is actually a metamorphic rock. You have changed the rock itself by recrystallizing it. Again, you're not melting it; you're just recrystallizing it somehow. Okay, how does that happen? Well. You can get this thing called contact metamorphism, metamorphism, which is when you get magma that's actually that actually comes in. It doesn't actually the magma itself would make an igneous rock, but whatever it touches could become changed from that heat. Okay, so what's happening is you've got uh, well in this case it says uh, high temperatures, high water content, lots of chemical activity. Okay, and you're not actually deforming it much. You've got lots of chemical stuff going on. Why? Because you're heating it up and you're kind of changing the, the chemical properties of it. Okay, it's like you're baking it in some sense. Okay, and we're generally not deforming it. We're just like changing it due to this heat. Okay, all right. More classification: metamorphic rock. Foliated means you've got layers, kind of like sedimentary, but you've got that. And non-foliated, no layers. Okay. All right. Here's some slate. This is the foliated stuff where you've got layers. Slate. You've got uh, this cup called schist. I suppose that's how it's pronounced, or schist. Schist, I think. And then you've got this is called gneiss. Nice. That's where you pronounce it too. Gneiss. Nice. All right. And this looks very much layered, right? So it looks like sedimentary rock. Might have been sedimentary rock, but it's been changed chemically. It's been deformed and it's been changed. Um, somehow chemically via heat or some other process. Okay. Then you've got non-foliated metamorphic rock like marble or quartzite. Again, you can see some maybe layers in there, but they're not 
well, you can see some strict layers, but there's also like other little piece, like pieces and parts. That's, that happens from when the, the rock has been changed by all this heat or chemically like mixed together. Okay? So if I asked you what type of rock is marble, you'll say metamorphic. You don't even worry about non -fol I'm not going to ask you a non-foliated question. Just, to, just want you to see it. Marble is number two. number two. Well, it is, but it's also crystalline metamorphosized limestone. <laughs> eh, I didn't, we didn't even go over that. Sorry. OK. All right, last one on this. Rock cycle. Molten rock. OK. Uh, let's see. I'm not going to play the rock cycle video. There is a little rock cycle video, but it's just, it's just going over this. What happens is you start with magma, right? This magma. Well, that can cool, and we know that turns into igneous rocks. Well, igneous rocks, when they get broken up chemically or physically or whatever, will go into those layers and produce our sedimentary rock. Okay? We can also get uh, cementation and compaction to form other sedimentary kind of rocks. And then we can get, we add heat and we add pressure and we change the rock chemically into something else, you can end up with metamorphic rock. And then what if it melts again? Ends up back at molten rock. Okay, so it's like a cycle. Okay, now, of course, you can go from metamorphic rock and that can also be weathered and changed and turned back into sediment, sedimentary rock. And then it can go this way. The path can go this way, right? But the path can also go around like this. So it's really a cycle. It's a very, again, it's a very long cycle, generally. Okay, and it's a uh, it's a cycle that you know continues. Okay, and you just you add some heat, you add some weathering, all that kind of stuff goes together. If you do want to see the video, it's actually on in your book, uh, in the online version of the book. You can see the video if you go to the end of this chapter. Okay, all right. So we're going to go to plate tectonics. Let's take our next break now, and then we will get into the plate tectonics in a bit. All right, we're ready to go. Okay. Plate tectonics. OK, I think some of you will find this a little more engaging than the rocks thing. Although, for what it's worth, if you really dig into the rock stuff, you can get, I, I think it probably becomes more interesting. Um, but I will uh, admit, admittedly, I, I, I don't know enough about it to really dig into the really interesting part. But you know, some people love it. So um, let's talk about plate tectonics, which is at the beginning I showed you a picture of the Earth and the various plates on there. Really cool that this, hap this stuff happens. And it wasn't until fairly recently, like maybe like 100 years ago, which is still relatively recent, that we actually figured out some of this stuff. OK? OK. First question. What would it take to dig to the center of the Earth? It would take a lot, right? That's kind of an understatement, OK? An understatement because um, the Earth's radius is 6,000. I was wrong before. I said 3,000. It's 6,371 kilometers. Kilometers. 4,000 miles. Like, you would have to drive farther than from New York to Los Angeles to get to the center of the Earth. Like, driving down. Right? That's how far it is to get to the center. Right? Well, there was a movie that came out um, in the 90s called The Core, right? And it starred Hilary Swank, who, you know what? She's won two Academy Awards, so I can't, you know, complain about her. But the acting in this movie was, that was OK. The story was terrible, right? It was this tor terrible story about, about like, the, the, it was about the core, like, stopping moving and, like, magnetism stopping and, Birds falling out of the sky and this and that, right? It was, it was, it was, and like the whole like world depended on Hillary Swank and her buddies getting in this crazy uh, like spaceship-like Earth digger to like dig to the center of the Earth and restart the core and completely ridiculous. In fact, I once taught a physics class where we gave. Like the final exam was the kids got to watch the core and had to fill out everything that was wrong about it physically. Yeah, it was so bad. Yeah, great final exam. Well, no, it was terrible because it, it really was so bad. Well, anyway, so this was, you know, this is not, we are not going to dig to the center of the Earth. So the question is how do we figure out what is actually underneath the Earth, right? Like inside the Earth. 
Nothing's underneath the Earth. What's inside the Earth, right? How do we figure this out? Well, there are ways to do this, okay, to figure it out. Okay? The interior of the Earth. Now, we will start with what we've figured out, and then we'll go back and figure out how we figured that out. We'll show you how we figured that out. But we talked a little bit about this earlier, right? We've got the crust. Well, we've got a couple things. We've got the oceanic crust, which is basically the ocean, which is only about 10 kilometers, right? I mean, the deepest, the deepest trench is the Marianas Trench, which is like seven miles deep or something like that. And that's like one place in the Earth, right? Which is that it, the, so on average, like 10 kilometers or, or less. Then you've got the continental crust, which is actually the, the uh, dirt and rocks and everything on the crust itself, 20 to 60 kilometers. Still pretty, um, still pretty thin when it comes down to it, but thick enough that we've never dug through the crust. Now, I just read something online um, that talks about there's like a billion dollar project to try to dig into the mantle. We're going to spend a billion dollars to dig down and figure out what actually is under there. We have a pretty good idea, but hey, it's science, right? Might as well do it. And you know, that kind of technology, for what it's worth, We'll learn how to dig better, and digging is kind of important. So, you know. uh, I don't know who's paying for it. Could be nice Exxon, for all I know, but it also could be taxpayers. I don't know. Who knows? But it's science, so it's okay. All right. So then you've got the mantle, which we said was about was pretty big. The mantle itself is almost 3,000 kilometers. It's big, right? Then you've got the outer core, which is. 2,200, 2,300 kilometers. Also pretty big. This is all liquid. Liquid, well, yeah, I guess magma. I mean, it's molten, molten iron, basically. Okay, and then the inner core, which is not molten anymore because it's such a high pressure that it actually solidifies and it's like solid iron in there. And that, and it, the, even the inner core is like 1,200 kilometers. So it's really, really like far to get down here, right? So we're talking about a lot of stuff. Okay. Here's how we figured all this stuff out. Earthquakes. Okay? And not only earthquakes, but also, um, well, earthquakes formed from natural earthquakes. And also when we did a lot of nuclear testing, believe it or not, that, that uh, helped out geology immensely. Because every time you test a nuclear weapon, you get basically an earthquake. And, you can, and when the Russians were testing bombs and we were testing bombs, both of our countries put up really sensitive seismographs to measure this stuff. And guess what? You can do lots of science with those things. So they did. So kind of a benefit of the nuclear arms race is we got a lot of good geology out of it. So for what it's worth. If you'll remember, uh, the speed of a wave is dependent on what it's going through. right? Remember, it's not dependent on the frequency of the wave or the wavelength. It's depending on the material that it's going through. And if it's like a sound wave or a wave caused by vibrations, it's going to go at a certain speed. So we know that the speed at which seismic waves go through Earth, if we, if we can measure that, which we can by having a seismograph on one part and then a seismograph on the other part, you measure the differences in when the wave actually hits point A and point B, and you can figure out what's inside the Earth to a certain, uh, uh, to a certain amount. Okay? So we've already talked about this. Wave speed is different on the type of material. Okay? And that's what we're going to use to figure out something about the internal, internal part of the Earth. OK. Here's the types of waves we have. We've got primary waves. We've got secondary waves. We've got these waves called love waves, which are named after a guy, I think, not like the emotion. Right? And we've got Raleigh waves. Okay? These two are actually surface waves. These two are body waves, which go through the Earth itself. Okay, like so you have an earthquake, you got all four of these kind of waves. Primary waves, which go back and forth. What kind of wave is that? Longitudinal, Longitudinal wave. Remember that from earlier, a yeah. couple of chapters ago, right? Secondary waves. Transverse. Transverse waves, right? Okay. And the surface waves, you've got love waves, which are the which are the longitudinal ones, and you've got, I think, although that looks a little odd. Kind of a combination, it looks like. And then Raleigh waves, which are the uh, transverse waves at the surface. Okay? Interestingly, secondary waves, because they're transverse, do not go through liquid, 
which I read that in the book and I went, wait a minute. But we do, we see transverse waves on the surface of water all the time. Why don't these waves go through liquid? Well, it turns out, and I had to read all about this and it was kind of cool, the waves that you see on the surface, the only reason they are able to be transverse is because it's the surface. And there's certain, there's surface tension that enables, like, if you shake a string back and forth, you can create a transverse wave, right? But what's happening is that there's, the, the wave has to have something to bounce back the other way. If you try to do a, a if you were underwater and you had some, like, um, I don't know, something that you could shake up and down, you wouldn't get a wave going through the water. You would, it would actually be going up and down. Like, your wave would be like, if you did this with, like, let's say you had a, 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 a square plate, metal plate underwater, and you went boom, 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 boom. Which way would the wave go? Up and down, right? It would be a longitudinal wave. It wouldn't go side to side like a transverse wave. The only reason when you do that and you get a transverse wave is because something has to like, respond back in the other direction, which is what happens in solids because you can push on a solid one way and it'll bounce back and then the wave will go through it like this, right? Okay. So interestingly, that secondary waves don't go through liquids. It may become important in a minute. Okay. Primary waves, longitudinal, they compress and expand the material which they move. Okay, we already talked a little bit about this. Primary waves go through any kind of material, rock and water and air and whatever. And they're also faster. Okay, turns out they're faster because of the way they're produced. And they're the first ones you get when you look at the little seismograph. Okay. Then you get secondary waves. Okay. Secondary waves are these transverse waves. Okay. They vibrate the rock up and down and side to side. And remember, the motion is perpendicular to the energy because it's a transverse wave. They go through solids. They do not move through liquids. Okay? And they happen to be slower. So you first see the P waves. Then a little bit later, you see the, the S or secondary waves. Okay. All right. The surface waves are, OK, the, here's, here's what it was. It, wasn't, it was a rolling type motion. Okay, those are the Raleigh waves. Okay, they uh, are a little bit like ocean waves. Okay, and the tumbling actually tumbles backwards, I guess, to the direction of travel. So if you were standing here and the wave kind of went this way, by the time it got to you, it might pick you up and make you go backwards a little bit because of the mo motion of the rolling. Okay, and the ground actually does go up and down. And then love waves are kind of similar to S waves in that. This motion is side to side, and it's whip-like. I think these are the ones that are the worst. Like once these waves hit you, like you're going to get lots of damage. That's from what I understand. Okay. So now we've got these waves. Yeah. Was it Doctor Love? Like side to side? Probably Doctor Love. Yeah. I had a uh, a friend of mine in who also taught physics, and his name was Mr. Love. Like his last name was Love, and Mr. Love. He tried to get MrLove.com for his website, but you know. He's it was probably taken in like the day after the internet was born. <laughs> the day it was taken, but okay. The most destructive, the most destructive earthquakes are caused by the passage of surface waves because what? Do they travel faster? Do they occur on the crust, which is the densest layer? Do they occur at the surface, where the ground shakes up and down, or do they travel deep in the Earth's interior? Four. Which one? Because they travel deep in the interior? Is your house deep in the interior? Is your house deep in the interior? The most destructive stuff is when your house falls down or your building falls down, right? So what did you say, Bobby? Surface. They occur at the surface. Ah, tsunami is totally different. Different situation. This is deep into the interior? No. No. Tsunamis are different, which, which has to do with the water, the ocean, and so forth. We'll get to that. But as far as the destructive part, the destructive ones are the surface waves because they happen at the surface. This is not like this is what's supposed to be a trick question. It's just look, that's why, because you're that's where all your stuff is that gets destroyed. Okay. All right. Bless you. Okay. Now here's where we get into some more interesting stuff. Abrupt changes in seismic wave velocity tells you about the inner boundaries of the Earth. Okay? 
Remember, the top portion of the Earth, the crust and the mantle, are made from less dense material because when the Earth cooled, the denser stuff went to the middle. So you've got less dense stuff. Well, when we talk about waves going through less dense into dense material, well, just like any waves, they will bend when they go to a material that is a different speed. Aha. Okay. So now you can actually look at the changes in wave velocity, in other words, by the bending, and, and also the timing, like you can tell. And the, diff- the density of the different layers is when, how you can, you know, what you can figure out from this. Okay. All right, 1906. There was this dude, Richard Oldham, who observed the following. P waves and S waves travel for a distance and then no more S waves for a while, but the P waves continue. What did he discover? He, he made an observation based on this. What? Interdisciplinary? Well, hold on. So here's what he noticed. Here's the Earth, and here's the core, and here's the mantle, right? So he determined this core mantle boundary. But let's see what's going on. The P waves come through. I'm going to draw them kind of like longitudinal waves. Okay? And there's some S waves also coming down here. Okay? Some, some, long, some uh, uh, transverse waves. And then the P waves go boop, 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 all the way over to this side, and no more S waves. What does that tell you about this stuff in here? Solid. What's solid? The core solid. Nope. The, the S waves go through solids, solid. but they don't go through they liquids. Stop the they stop at the magma. So but that's what he decided, that's what he made, he figured out. Well, so what's going on there is there's probably some, the, so the, yeah, the picture says, oh, the, the S waves pick back up at, when they, at the inner core. That may be because of, uh, like, it travels around somehow. I, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a little odd to think that it just, like, at the inner core, it starts back up again. Um, but they do, they do talk about that, so I'm not sure exactly how that's the case, if it's all, you know, if it's all, uh, how it actually does that inside the inner core. But anyway, this guy first figured this out. He looked at the seismographs, and he figured this out. And by the way, this is a secondary form of experiment, right? He does not look at this. He can't see this stuff. He's actually using this. We will see very similar types of thought processes when we get to astronomy in a couple weeks, okay? Because astronomy, sure, you can see a lot of things with, with light. But most astronomy these days is not done by light waves, well, it's done by electromagnetic waves, but it's not done by light waves that you see. It's done by uh, like x-rays and gamma rays and all that sort of stuff where you're just basically collecting all this data that goes into a computer and you have to analyze the data. It's basically what this guy did, except in 1906 he didn't have a computer. He did it on on paper, right? Okay. A lot of paper. A lot of paper probably, yeah. Okay. A couple years later, this person named Andrija Mohorovicic. I actually had to look up how to pronounce that, and I didn't get the little. Andrea. There's some. Th- this is uh, Andrea. I guess it is just Andrea. Andrea Mohorov- Mohorovicic. Mohorovicic. Uh, one of these guys has a little. Uh, I forget, like like a little like carrot on there, and maybe a something like that. It's. Uh, the C has a tail. Does it? Like like down here, you mean? In the book, something it is in the book. The C, this one has a B over it. That's an oh, an actual V, like that. And the C over here has an accent. Okay, anyway, that's how it is. But anyway, he's from uh, Croatia, maybe. Is that what it was? Yeah, the English math class. Okay, anyway, so he in he observed a sharp increase in seismic velocity at a shallow layer within the Earth. So this guy, okay, did some more observations of the seismographs and noticed that, oops, at some inner layer here, let's see if I can do this right, at some inner layer here, he noticed that there was a 
increase in velocity. So the way it came through, it was going nice and slow, and then it went whoop and sped up. Ah, he noticed a different, in dense, different density. Okay? He said, aha, at that little point there, you've got to have more density because waves will go faster in a higher density material. And he said he discovered the crust, and they said he discovered the crust mantle boundary. Okay? Thin outer crust is not very dense. The mantle is much more dense. Aha, 1909. So we're talking about 1906, then 1909. And we're finding something out about the layers. OK, here's the mantle core boundary. OK, 1913, this other guy named Gutenberg, not related to the guy with the printing press from hundreds of years before, refined Oldham's work by locating the depth of the core mantle boundary. OK, down here, core mantle boundary in there, okay? And they actually, it's hard to see in here, but the waves, when they react here, when they, when they hit the outer core, they react so strongly that they actually peel off a little bit and cause what we call a shadow zone in here that the waves are actually kind of, they're kind of echoing in some sense, okay? There, there's an area where you actually get no waves in here because they bend away, and then these ones go through, and the bending away is kind of like an echoing, and they bend away, and you actually don't get any waves in there, which is kind of interesting. Okay, you wouldn't expect that if this was a solid, like piece. Okay, so he did that, and he and he detected that. Can I zoom in on it? Shh, uh, I can't on this computer. I actually don't know how, but it, it's it's in the book. Page 558. So again, what you've got is you've got the waves that are going, they're, they're hitting the outer core, refracting away, and some are going through, but the ones that are refracting away means that you don't actually see any of the waves on the other side of that core there. And same on the other side too. No detection. Okay. All right. Mantle core boundary. That was in 16, was it? No, 13, 1913. And then 1926, Sir Harold Jeffries figures out that uh, the core has to be liquid. Okay. Now, I thought the other guy did. Oh, the other people didn't realize that yet, I guess. They figured out that there was this boundary, but they hadn't figured out that it was liquid yet. Jeffries determined that it must be liquid. Okay. Probably because he realized that the waves, because the waves stopped, oh, they're this kind of wave, and they're, if they're transverse, they should go through solid, but they're not going through, etc. All these guys together, three different layers, cross mantle and core. 1926, that was like less than 100 years ago. Finally figured this stuff out. Okay. All right. Now we talk about the inner core, outer core. That's this liquid part and then solid part. Okay. This woman named Inga Lehman in 1936, just before World War II, observed that P waves also refract again inside the core. Okay? Remember, they're not looking at this. It's all data from seismographs. Pretty hard stuff, really. The P waves increase again in velocity, meaning that you've got more dense material. So she goes, huh, if it's liquid and then it gets more dense, how is that happening? Well, we're probably getting a solid again. So she says, aha, inside, there, inside the core, there must be a solid inner core. Okay, liquid outer core, solid inner core. Okay, and then finally we have the whole picture of the Earth. Crust, thin, less dense crust. Thick mantle that's pretty dense but not too dense. Core, liquid core on the outside, really dense. Inner core, even more dense and solid. Okay. Well, I mean, they're theories that we can show the data for and show that it's the case, you know, that, that we can, what, what, what we, the good, the good question, I mean, is it proven? <clears throat> Nobody's actually gone down there and looked. Know, we but, Mars, we went to Mars, but we, yeah, right, well, right, we can't send probes through the center of Earth, that's true. But, what we, what scientists do to prove this is they make, they make a hypothesis about something else that'll happen. They say, okay, so we know that uh, we're going to, we're going to test a nuclear bomb. Well, if we test nuclear bomb and our model is true, we should be able to put a seismograph at this point on Earth and, and get a wave. And if we put it over here, we won't get one because it's in that shadow zone. 
And then they do it, and they test it, and they find out they're right. So that you know, proves that their theory still works. right? So you can never really completely prove a theory, because you can, al you can always disprove a theory right? if it's not true, because you just find one experiment that disproves it. Well, not true anymore. But you can never say, well, we're absolutely 100% sure, because you can always find out more information that might change it a little bit. But for what we know, that's pretty good so far. And it, all the experiments we do, we know how to predict them now. So, okay. All right. OK, so here's what the core, according to experiment, is composed of. Mostly metallic iron, just iron. Okay, two layers. We already talked about this: solid inner core, liquid outer core. And by the way, they they think that the liquid outer core is what's causing the magnetic fields, because it's moving metal, which is moving charges, really, right? And that movement creates the magnetic field of the Earth. That's what they say. I think that's still the predominant theory. Okay. The inner core solid because of lots of pressure. Outer core less pressure, liquid. Oh, and it says right here, Earth's magnetic field flow in the outer core. Okay. All right. Okay, let's go back up to the mantle for a minute. Okay, the mantle, 82% of the Earth's volume. Not only is it thick, right, but it's like most of the Earth. Why is it most of the Earth? Well, volume-wise, if you think about it. It's like this much, which is a whole heck of a lot of volume, right? Versus the core, which is not quite as much volume, and of course the crust isn't. So when we're talking about the mantle, most of the Earth is mantle, okay? 65% of the Earth's mass. Why is it only 65? Well, it's 85% of the volume because the stuff in the center is really dense, lots of mass down there, okay? All right. Lots of oxygen and silicon, again, because it's closer to the surface. That's where most of the oxygen and silicon went. And it does have other elements like irons and magnesium and all that. Two regions. Believe it or not, there are two regions of the mantle, the upper mantle and the lower mantle. Okay? We are going to talk a little bit about the differences between those two. Okay. The upper mantle is called the astenosphere. I'm not going to ask you to memorize that. Okay, the lower one, or sorry, the, the, hang on. The upper mantle has two zones, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere. The lower part is called the asthenosphere. Hmm. The lower part of the, oh, the lower part of the upper mantle. Yeah, sorry. So the asthenosphere is the lower part of the ma upper mantle, and the lithosphere is the lower part. Can we drill down there? Not yet. Maybe for a billion dollars. And drill down there. Okay. So there's a big volcano. Come out, right? No, 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 it's not gonna come out. It's not necessarily molten. It's still not it's not me, it's not molten there, right? And parts of it might be, but remember the mantle is solid. And we're only drilling to the mantle. We're certainly not drilling through it. Okay. Yeah. Because that's cause that would take thousands of miles. Yeah. For a billion dollars. For a billion dollars? Well, you can't do it. By the way, quick gravity lesson. If you, chapter one, no, chapter three or four, or whatever it was. If you were somehow to drill a hole straight through the earth and make a little tube straight through the earth, and you jumped into the tube, okay, at, in the middle, do you know how much your weight would be right in the middle? You would have zero weight. Because all the rest of the Earth is pulling in all directions away from you, and it all cancels out. Pretty cool, right? Well, you would go, well, let's say you're in a suit that kept you away from the heat and all that kind of stuff, right? You jump down in there, or you just kind of step off into this hole that goes all the way through to the center, of the, to the other side. And you'd go down, and you'd be going really fast by the middle, right? Because you're falling the whole time. Now, when you get to the other side of the middle, which way is gravity now pulling you? back down this way. So you slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. If it was a frictionless tube, you would get to the other side and you would slow down just to the point where you could reach out and grab the top and then climb out. Yeah, of, uh, right? Well, it's all symmetrical, right? So you jump down here and you go whipping down. And by the way, 42 minutes. That's all it takes. That's how fast you get going. You get going so fast that it's 42 minutes. Pretty cool thing. And, interestingly enough, if you're to drill a, a 
if you were to drill like a, a tube like that, so, kind of like that, if you jumped in this tube, well, you'd just, just slide because you'd be pulled this way, right? But you'd slide. Let's say you grease yourself up like a big giant slide. It'd be a lot of fun. You'd go jump in here, and then you'd go, same thing would happen. You'd go whipping down here, you'd get to about here, and then you'd start uh, slowing down, and you'd get right up to the top, and you'd be able to grab the top if it was frictionless, right? You know how long that would take? Not 42 minutes. No, 42 minutes. Really? Turns out that if you do the math and you do all the calculus and everything, no matter how you dig, dig a hole, 42 minutes. If you were to dig a hole like right at the edge of the earth right there and let a little marble go, whoop, 42 minutes. With no friction. No friction, yeah. Now, if you didn't grab on, let's say you didn't grab on down here, what would you do? You'd go, whoa, fly past here, 42 minutes later, you'd get up here. If you didn't grab on, you'd go, whoa, back on. You'd just oscillate back and forth. I'll be back in an cool. hour and a half. I'll be back in an hour and a half, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. Pretty cool stuff. All right, anyway, back to the asthenosphere. OK, here's an interesting thing about the asthenosphere. It is solid, but it behaves in a plastic manner, allowing it to flow. Now, when we talk about flow, we are talking about relatively slow flow. And we are talking about solid flowing through other solids. OK, so it's like the Earth itself is able to flow, but we're talking about like thousands of years or millions of years for like flow to happen. Okay, but it is plastic. It does allow like big rocks to sink down farther and little rocks to sink to float up and or actually I guess the other way around, the little rocks kind of sink a little bit. Well the more dense ones sink, the less dense ones float to the top. Okay? The constant flowing is what affects the surface features like making mountains and making uh, like islands and things. Okay. All right. The asthenosphere, or the, the other one is called the other part of the, the upper part of the upper mantle and the crust is called this lithosphere. Okay. Cool and rigid. Cool, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, it's, as you said, as we said, every 30 kilometers down you go into the mantle, you get about, no, sorry, what, what was it? Three. Every kilometer you get 30 degrees hotter. Every kilometer, you get 30 degrees hotter. But on the top here, pretty cool. Okay, rigid. You're not going to get much flow in the core, in the mantle, or sorry, in the crust and the mantle. You get some because you do get mountains poking up and islands poking up, but you don't get that much, right? It doesn't really flow, but it actually floats on the athenosphere below. This is where we're going to start talking about the uh, the tectonic plates. Okay. The lithosphere is broken up into plates. These are called the tectonic plates. We will move on to those in a minute. The movement of the lithospheric plates causes earthquakes, volcanoes, deformation of rock, big stuff that people don't like. How many of you have been in an earthquake? Small one? Earthquake? Small one? I was in a relatively, well, it was a pretty small one in Virginia a couple years ago. There was an earthquake in Virginia. You might have remembered it. It was actually near Charlottesville where I lived. And it was, uh, the building shook back and forth. I thought they were doing construction next door, but it was pretty, nobody, got, nobody got hurt. But it was lots of, like, the building shook for like 30 seconds. So it's pretty cool. I lived in California for three years and never got an earthquake. So mm, I don't know. Yeah, I know. Four years, actually. I never got an earthquake. I keep missing them. You keep missing them? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, all right. So that was the upper mantle, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere. The lower mantle goes about 700 kilometers down. Okay, uh, this is not a very big picture, not a good picture, but you got an upper mantle here, then you've got the lower mantle. Okay, great pressure, certainly solid, not going to have flow like the upper mantle. Okay. okay, let's go back up to the crust for a minute. Okay, crust, two regions in the crust. We've got the oceanic crust, which is about 10 kilometers thick, like we said. Consists of lots of bals bal basaltic rocks. And then you've got the continental crust, which is actually thicker, but pokes up out of the oceanic crust. Okay? You've got the continental crust here, which has this kind of this root, we call it. And that sticks up out of the oceanic crust. That's a little odd. Okay? The, the continental crust sticks down. Does this remind you of anything? Skin. Skin? 
Does it remind you of anything? Yeah, yeah adult tooth. Let's pretend this was water and this was sticking up a little above the water. What's it look like? A boat or an island or how about an iceberg? See how the iceberg kind of floats? No, the iceberg like floats up a little bit. This is what's going on here. We'll get to this in a minute. But the idea is that the continental crust, even though it's, it happens to be, uh, it's actually, uh, it actually sticks up much like an iceberg. We'll get, get into the detail about that. Okay? It's not as dense as the uh, oceanic crust. It's kind of like an iceberg. It's not as dense as the water it's in. And therefore, it actually ends up allowing it to float up. And it's, believe it or not, the floating is a, a buoyant force, just like any other buoyant force that we talk about. Okay. All right. So the internal layers, this is an I, by the way, iostasy. Okay. The word iostasy, these are the internal layers, okay? Iosti deals with or derives from the Greek roots iso meaning equal and stasis meaning standing, equal standing. Okay? The iostasy means the vertical position up and down so that you've got the gravitational force and the buoyant force on this part of the crust. Okay? The low density crust actually floats on the mantle. Even though it's you know giant, you could never if you walked up to it, you wouldn't call it floating. But in a bigger picture, the uh, crust is actually floating on the mantle, okay? and that's why we can end up getting these uh, plates moving along. Okay, this is why continents are high and oceans are low. You get variations in the surface elevations because of the thickness and density of the crust. It's kind of like an iceberg. Okay, the continental crust actually are higher because the continental crust is less dense and so it floats up higher than the oceanic crust. That's why you get mountains and that. Okay, here we go. Check question. Earth's crust is thicker beneath a mountain because why? The roots of the mountain are heavier. The mountains sink until the upper buoyant force balances the downward gravitational force. The mantle rock is weak or the ocean crust is thin. This isn't a very, this, this, I should have put this check question later, but yeah, it's two. Okay? Get this buoyant force thing going on. Right, good. All right. Now, this is where we get into some more cool, like, guys figuring cool stuff out. Okay. Continental drift. This dude named Alfred Wegener. Okay. First of all, he's just awesome because he's like smoking that cool-looking pipe, right? You can't, you can't look and wearing that like. Is that a hat or is his hair? It's a hair. That's his haircut? Is it? What's it look like in the book? God did not show in the book, maybe. I think this is from Wikipedia. Um, this is the guy that finally figured, that figured out that continents drift. Okay? Well, what he said was, look, the continents once were one giant mass, and they drifted apart. And he actually called that Pangea. Okay, called universal land, one big piece. Okay, and he said, look, this all makes sense. And he talked about why, we'll get to that in a minute. But nobody believed him, right? Everybody like ridiculed him. How long did it take you when you were a kid to look at a world map to realize that South America and Africa fit together pretty perfectly? About three seconds, right? You look at it and you go, come on. Those two like fit like a jigsaw, right? If you just go, you could slide them together and they fit perfectly. Right? And if you look, North America actually fits right underneath the Africa there. And I don't know what Europe's doing, but, but, it's, but all these pieces like fit perfectly together if you squash them all together. Right? It's just not that hard. This guy looked at that and went, this, this makes total sense. Okay? He said it looks like a jigsaw. Mm -hmm. okay? It looks like a jigsaw piece. He said, guess what? Fossils here in South America, right on this edge, Match fossils in this part of Africa. What? Okay, well, that's interesting. The rocks look the same. He looked at all the sedimentary rocks and he said all the sediments are same here and same here. Interesting, right? He said the mountain chains look the same, like how they were, they're formed. And there was some other evidence dealing with the, the climate from way back when that he, they had to do other, other kind of uh, uh, analysis to figure out. But it, the, you, you looked and you said, ah, 
the climate way back when was the same here and the same here. So he said that all those things together. And then he said, actually it's not even on here, I don't think. There's one he also looked at various seeds from trees. There are some trees that are in this part of South America and this part of Africa, same trees, with these big seeds that are not going to float from one continent to the other. Right? There's the same sort of animals over here. Right? There's some animals here that are here and here. Not talking about like giraffes and things, but animals that are uh, similar on one side, on this continent and this continent, and they're not going to swim. Right? It's not going to happen. Okay? So he made all these observations and he said, look, this is what it is. And nobody believed him. Okay? Despite the evidence to support it, he couldn't actually explain how they moved. There was one problem. Number one, he didn't, he didn't understand like, the, the crust idea of how it's moving. People didn't believe that continents could like, break through all the other rock in the, in the world and create and, and move from one location to the other. They didn't understand that the, the mantle is relatively plastic and allows this movement. They didn't, didn't get that. So they said that was wrong. There was also a problem with um, the fact that there were some climate issues it would have made like the equator be freezing, and it didn't quite make sense. So people were like, forget it. They just didn't understand it. But if you look at this picture, way back when, it might have looked like this. He called it Pangaea. As you go through the Mesozoic era, right, you end up here. By the way, this is dinosaur time back here, right? Okay, actually, dinosaur about here. So dinosaurs, yeah, they, uh, they were in a totally different formed world at that point. Continents really didn't exist in the same form at that point. Okay, 65 million years ago. Uh, actually, I think 65 million years ago is when the final dinosaurs died, right about here. Okay, so it looked a little bit different. Okay, so Africa and South America were apart, and then finally today we get here. You know, right? Yeah, there were dinosaurs that lived back here that died out longer ago than the dinosaurs that here died out were alive. So dinosaurs ranged for a whole long time. Millions and millions and millions of years. Yeah. So what was on the other side of the globe if that was all together at one time? Uh, well, this is probably not really to scale. Like it kind of wraps around a little bit. Okay. But um, but I'm, I'm I would assume just ocean on the other parts of the That's parts why of the, back then they yeah. thought the world was flat. <laughs> right. I don't think that was why they thought the world was no. flat. I don't think there were people back then. Like people didn't start until about here. <laughs> right? So you you know, maybe like fifty thousand years ago or whatever people, right? So really all this movement happened well before people were around. And I don't think the dinosaurs thought too much about that. No. I don't think so. Too busy eating stuff. Okay. So eventually, okay, people started doing more experiments about the seafloor. And they realized there were lots of mountain ranges down in the ocean as well. The biggest mountain in the world is not Mount Everest. It's, an, it's a mountain that's underwater. I right? it was in, in uh, I'm not or sure where it is. That, that's the deepest fissure. Uh, deepest fissure? I don't, I don't know. I know the deepest trench is like the Indian Ocean, Marianas Trench, but I don't so know the, where the deep. The deepest land, I guess. Well. Yeah. Well, it turns out that. The deepest trenches are actually near the continents, okay? Near the, well, near the continental margins, near the continents. And it turns out that the deepest parts of the ocean are actually near the continents. And so it goes like this. Continent A, continent B, it goes deep, and then there's another like mountain range in the middle, right? And then that's really shallow. Like in the middle of the ocean, not shallow like you can go out and walk around. But shallow, like instead of being a thousand feet deep, it's like 400 feet deep or something like that. Why? Yeah, yeah. The islands, islands don't really count on this so much. Although Hawaii and other Pacific islands, yeah, that might be a ridge right there where they're created. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So people started saying, ah, it does look like there's more. There can be this movement going along. Okay. <clears throat> they talk about the sea floor spreading. Okay. A guy named Harry Hess came along and he said, hey, what if the sea floor actually spread out to make continental drift happen? Okay, the sea floor, in other words, not fixed, constantly renewed, and you get these ocean ridges, which is where the lithosphere keeps being formed. Okay? 
And the trenches are where the, you get the lithosphere destroyed. So here you've got an upwelling. And you've got the lithosphere coming along and then getting destroyed near the, uh, near the actual continents over here and on the other side. Okay. All right, so there's lots of drift here. If we look at magnetic studies of the ocean floor, this is really cool stuff. If you look at the, the ocean floor, it's got various uh, areas where it's more and less magnetic. And it goes in kind of waves. And if they look at that, they can kind of see what the uh, magnetic field of the Earth was as time goes backwards. Right? So it's pretty cool. You've got lava erupting and making this uh, nice iron-rich area. Well, we know iron can become magnetized. Okay? And as the magnetic field changes, you've got different changes in these layers. Okay, we call all this, the study of this, paleomagnetism, okay? which is when you can look at the magnetism based on the Earth and figure out the past from it. Pretty cool stuff. Okay? So, and you can kind of see it here. The sea floor actually has a record of the magnetic field. That is cool stuff. Okay? Zebra-like stripes. Okay? These stripes are caused by the various movement of the Earth's crust and the magnetic fields that happened over time. Okay? And it looks like the Earth's magnetic field has actually swapped a few times, too. Supposedly, we're due for one. That would be bad news for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Okay? But swapped, yeah, like the North Pole became the South Pole, and the South Pole became the North Pole magnetically. Okay? All right. So here's all the little tectonic plates. Okay? You've got the South American plate. You've got like the Caribbean plate, North American plate, all these different plates in here, okay, which are moving next to each other. Okay? And when the plate hits, by the way, you get these things called faults, and you get earthquakes and that sort of thing. So that's what causes most of this stuff. Okay? There are eight major plates. Okay? Uh, we don't really need to do too much on this stuff. The largest one is the Pacific one. Uh, several plates are a continent and some of the sea floor. Okay, there's only eight of them, so it's pretty good. Here's the relative motion of these. This is a little tricky to read. The, the, the longer the arrow, the faster the plates are moving. So like these, this plate moving pretty fast this way. The, this plate moving this way relatively fast. This plate not moving so fast because the arrow is shorter. These arrows are kind of short over here, not like where we are right now. We're not moving that fast this way. And by the way, by fast, I mean, again, like centimeters per year. Okay? I know, it's a little tough to see. Basically, the size of the so like North America, not moving very fast. It's tiny little arrows. Okay? Oceanic plates move pretty fast. Continental plates, kind of slow. Okay? Let's see. Check question. Continental plates move slow, than, slower than oceanic plates because Roots extend deeper, they're heavier, they're convergent, or because of gravity? I would say their roots are pretty deep. Yeah, the roots are deep. That's why they're not moving so fast. Nice deep roots are not going to move so fast through that other that mantle. Okay? More plate boundary stuff. Interactions at the plate boundaries. Creation and destruction. We get earthquakes, we get volcanoes, mountains along those plate boundaries. When two plates collide with each other, it forms a mountain sometimes because they're colliding and then the ground, the earth's got to go somewhere and it gets forced up. And that's where you get your mountain. Okay? Okay? All right, we're gonna, I, I'm going to fly through this stuff. Divergent plate boundaries, convergent plate boundaries, transform fault boundaries, lots of different types of boundaries. I'm not even going to really go into the details here because I want to get you through here. but. Um, you can have divergent, meaning they move away from each other. Okay? You can have convergent, meaning they move towards each other. And by the way, if you look at this, when they move, they can either do the welling up like the mountains, but one plate can go underneath another plate, and that could cause you know, lots of earthquakes and things. Okay? And ocean, oceanic, oceanic convergence, where two ocean plates will converge with each other. This is where you get the trenches, those deep trenches. You get some volcanoes, all kind of kind of interesting stuff. You get magma, volcanoes, all that. Okay. 
And then you've got oceanic continental convergence. The oceanic, the lithosphere goes underneath the continent. It's the continent, which remember is a little less dense, so it's above the ocean, will stay above this and kind of creep along. And it's the oceanic crust and so forth that goes below like that. And again, you can get volcanoes and mountains and all that. Okay. All right. And of course, you can have continents colliding with each other. Same thing. One continent's going to go up, one continent's going to go down, and similar to the other ones. Okay, this is causes the big mountains here. Okay. All right. All these details I'm not going to ask you about. Here's some more continental to continental. Giant mountains here. Deepest, strongest earthquakes. Lots of mountains. Himalayas caused by continental to continental convergence. Yep. Okay. All right, let's see, what do we have here? Um, uh, plates that slide past one another, side to side, okay? You don't really destroy any lithosphere, nothing's going under, okay? But you get some fault lines there where you're still getting movement, and that's going to cause fault lines, it's going to cause some earthquakes. Strong but shallow earthquakes. Okay? And then you've got transform fault boundaries. This is where you've got like an ocean and uh, you've got a massive continent. Anybody ever heard of the San Andreas Fault? Yeah, this is the one that supposedly is going to knock California into the ocean. <laughs> okay, this is the big one. This is why California gets lots of earthquakes. San Andreas Fault, boom, right there. Okay, it's a fault transform boundary. It looks like what? It looks like it's just going to knock the crappy part. <laughs> it's just going to knock, gonna, it's gonna knock some yeah. part of it. Yeah. Well, that's true. OK, again, we're going to fly through some of these slides. Uh, continental evidence. There is evidence for this stuff. OK? You get stresses, compression stress, tensile stress, which is pulling. And you've got shear stretch, which is pushed and pulled, OK, and sliding past each other. OK? You get lots of different types of deformation deforming of the rocks. Elastic, okay, returns back to its initial shape. Brittle means it breaks. Plastic means it's flowing. Okay. All right, not even going to worry too much about this stuff. There are two types of layers in plates, in folds. You've got one which is called an anticline, which looks like this. It's where the rock gets pushed up into these layers. And notice you've got the layers getting younger this way. So this is a nice old layer. Younger, 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 youngest layer. You've got this one called a syncline, where it's the exact opposite. You've got layers getting older as they go away from the syncline. Because you can see this is a nice young layer, young layer, and then the way the, the bowing up goes, older, 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 older. It's like pushing down, and then you get the what was down like this gets pushed up like this. And over here, you get what was I guess down, just straight down, gets kind of whoop, pushed straight up. It's all about how the layers get older. And not. Look, this one, look, this, look at this one in the, in the book when you get a chance. Here's a little question. This is kind of a trick question. This versus this, okay? it says um, there's rock layers and the ages. Here's the oldest age. Looks like this. This is old, old oldest, younger, younger, youngest. Youngest, absolutely youngest. Is this the anticline or the? Is this the anticline? You got to look back again. Hang on. Anticline is the one where it gets younger as you go away from it. So let's look at here. So you start here and you're going away. Are we getting younger? Yes. We are. That's the oldest. Young, young, young. So this has got to be the anticline. Over here, as we go away, we get older. Right? This is the youngest to older, so this has got to be the syncline. Okay. And we are correct, and you can read this later in the notes. But you get it, it's flipped upside down in this case, but it just happens to be the, you've got to look at the oldness of the layers. Okay. All right, we have faults. Okay, there's different types of faults where you've got a foot wall and a hanging wall. And if you, if you actually get an earthquake, you can get the separation. Okay. And 
You've got reverse faults, which is the opposite way. Don't worry about the details there. And more, and let's see, normal faults, the hanging wall drops down and hangs down. And we've got slip faults. Slip faults are interesting because the rock actually slips down, and that's what causes the, the shaking. Because you've got all that earth moving around, shaking. Okay, and actually this slips sideways in this case. Okay, and then finally, earthquakes. Earthquakes are kind of this ring of fire. You can see where most of the earthquakes happened. Right along here. Lots and lots of earthquakes in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, Japan gets huge earthquakes. Okay. And let's see, more earthquakes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I'm going to fly through this. Hang on. The Richter scale. We did talk about the Richter scale. Okay, you can look at this for a second. The Richter scale shows the effects as you go up and down. There's another scale now, too, they, this category scale. They don't talk about it in terms of the, uh, the actual uh, Richter scale. But the Richter scale, as you go up, remember, it's 10 times more than before. So 3 to 4 is 10 times more. So feel a few people feel indoors. The one I was in in Virginia was like this one, 4.5 or so, felt by everyone. Sleeping people may be awakened. Five, trees, chandeliers swing, damage. Six, you get vehicles when you're, you're moving. You can chimneys collapse. Now we're talking damage. 6.5, houses collapse. 7.5, buildings survive, but lots of stuff gets damaged, like bridges. Eight, total destruction. You get nine, even more total destruction, whatever that means. Okay. And then finally, tsunamis. I mentioned this right at the beginning. Tsunamis are caused from earthquakes, okay? But when the earth underneath the ocean collapses or moves, you're moving a lot of water. When that water moves, that creates a giant wave, okay? And you can either get the seafloor moving upwards or downwards. And when water gets displaced like that, well, it's got to go somewhere. And it happens to go, if it going, it's going towards land, it ends up going towards land. Look up on YouTube tsunami videos. There are tons of them on there, especially about the 2004 and 2011. It is crazy, crazy stuff. Okay? And it's not as fast as you think. It's not like you're just sitting there and all of a sudden like, this giant wave comes up. It's like the water goes out for a while. There's, there's pictures of people in Thailand, like little kids running around like the water is gone. And they're running around like picking up fish and rocks and like, oh, whoa, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody's realizing that half an hour from then, it's going to be like that water is going to come rushing back in and all up into the ocean and kill like thousands and thousands of people. So crazy, crazy stuff, tsunamis. Okay, but they're mainly called by, caused by reverse fault earthquakes. Okay? And these days, we're pretty good at predicting whether or not there were, well, not predicting, but alerting people about whether there's going to be a tsunami or not. So that's that. OK, I know that was a ton of stuff at the end. I apologize. Uh, but go feel free if you want. Read the chapter. Go back and look at the notes again. And that'll do it. I will see you on Saturday. Okay? Um, I have to go to Kenya on Wednesday. I get back on early Saturday morning, so hopefully no planes will get jammed. So. What's that? I'll have some Tusker while I'm in Nairobi.